At 6 a.m., our cat Miso puked in the bed. <laughs> and then I opened my eyes, and I just see Miso going, glug, 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 and I said, damn it, no! And I shoved her. And uh, that's when I realized, I don't think I'm ready for childhood. Because you can't just wake up and go, damn it, no, at like a baby. And you can and shove it off shove the bed. it off the bed. <laughs> You're getting it on the comforter. Trekking heavier, traveling light. There's one thing that's right wherever I go. That's where I am. Oh, that's perfect. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Zoltan. My name is Zoltan Cassis. I just spilled coffee on my shirt right as we start our first... Uh, this is a throwback episode. We're going solo. There's no guest next to me. I tried. I didn't try hard. I reached out to, like, one guy, and he's like, can we do it next week? And I'm like, yeah. And then I was like, you know what? I'm not going to bring anybody. I'm going to do it like I used to in my living room looking out my window where I used to just open my heart and soul to you guys and then get uncomfortable when someone walked by the, the sidewalk in the front of the house then I'd feel like they were watching me watching myself. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to do it solo. But uh, it was a good... I don't know, man. Like, I wanted... First of all, it was a great weekend. I was just talking to... Uh, to Man, I'm so sorry. I forgot your name. Tom. Tom. I'm sorry. There's Mike, Tom, and there's Jiggy. There's the... Yeah. Which I don't know his real name. It's like Jigatoni or something. Mark. Mark. His last name, yeah. Yeah, his, his last name is pretty wild. But uh, I was telling Tom, we had a wonderful weekend this past weekend. Uh, we did the Philly Punchline. Thank you guys for packing that room. And then drove five hours through nothing to get to Pittsburgh, where I did, uh, I did a show solo for the first time because I was too lazy and I couldn't find an opener in Pittsburgh. So I just did the entire thing myself. And I liked it. I kind of liked it. I was like, uh, I didn't know if I could cover the time. And then I realized I covered the time fine. I did like an hour 20. And it was perfect. I kind of had to warm up the room myself. Kind of had to set my own table. Uh, you know, pretty much burn the first five minutes of my set, getting comfortable. But then after that, it, it all made sense. I think it was mainly the drive that was weird. I, I, learned, uh, I learned the brand of East Coast white trash that you kind of see at the gas stations between, like, New York and Philly. Like, I didn't know about that. My wife made the driver with me, and, like, I grew up... I First of all, I feel like I'm allowed to say white trash because I grew up in the trailer park, so I'm speaking of my people. I'm allowed to, like, give this, I think. I don't know. Maybe someone with uh, with their father's tattoo on their arm will beg to differ with me, but <laughs> I kind of think I'm allowed... <laughs> Uh, it's, it was interesting to see East Coast white trash, because, like, there's, like, Southern white trash, which they're proud of it. They, they embrace it. They wear it like a badge of honor, which I think is the best way to do it. A lot of times they'll have it tattooed somewhere on them that just says white trash, uh, which, uh, more power to them while they're rocking around in, uh, in one of those, like, 80s Camaros. Uh, I'm all for that. And then there's, like, West Coast white trash. Where they think they're not white trash because they own a boat and go to the river in Arizona. And you're like, dude, you're not fooling anybody with that flat build hat and dicky shorts. Like, you're, come on, man. Like, yeah, you don't live in the trailer park, but you would if you didn't find a house in the hills for less than a million dollars. So there's that. And then there's this East Coast white trash, which I'm new to, and I kind of saw it at these rest stops. It's this kind of white trash where they're trying, you can tell... They're bettering themselves, but they have a long way to go. But they all walk around with this attitude of like, I'm doing great. You should have seen me a month ago. And you're looking at them like, congrats, but also good Lord. Like what? Hey, I don't even know if that's a correct explanation of what I saw. And this is no indictment on the people that came to my shows in Philly and Pittsburgh. Those people were wonderful, upstanding citizens, had all their teeth for the most part, uh, super kind it's just those in-between parts. That drive from New York City to Philly and then from Philly to Pittsburgh gives you the chills. It's just one of those places where you stop and you get a McDonald's somewhere and the person behind the counter holds eye contact too long before responding to whatever your order was. I, I, I stopped somewhere and I was like, can I just get a hot coffee? And she just kind of, there was a Mississippi there as she registered my order. I think she was just blown away that I wasn't getting fries or anything else. And I was like, no, 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 just a hot coffee. And she just had a long, that's it? And I was like, yeah, milk, sugar, black. 
okay. And then it took her way too long back there. I think she was so used to putting all this stuff and then she just came back like, really, that's it? And I'm like, I promise you that's it. <laughs> and that was my entire experience from those gaps. From those gaps. The only thing we stopped and did that was outside of that is we went to Lancaster on the drive back, which is like Amish country. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done Amish? Mm, I've never been there, no. No, it's... But I know about it. You know, like... So my only experience with Lancaster and Amish country in the past was I did a college outside in Lancaster, PA, but it was in the farm country of Lancaster where I landed in like Harrisburg and I had to drive three hours through cornfields to get to this town that had a school and the, the, the kids put me up at a, at a bed and breakfast because the town didn't have a hotel. Hmm. And all I had to do was use the bathroom. I had a number two coming in hot because I had just taken a red eye flight from San Diego. I'm on coffee. I'm coming in jittery, and I just show up to this house in the middle of a cornfield, and there's no one there. I'm knocking on the door. There's no one's answering. I'm calling the phone number they gave me, and it's knocking on it's knocking on the devil's door back there. I'm it's waiting to That's run creepy, out. Yeah. yeah, and I'm like, where is this person? She's not answering. Goes to like some answering machine. And so I hop on Hotwire, and I see that there's a Super 8, like, 30 minutes away. So I book that immediately and haul ass over there before I ruin the only pair of pants I brought on the trip. And uh, and that was my experience with Lancaster, just a nowhere town with a college and with Amish people kind of milling around, you know? And so that's what I thought Lancaster was going to be when we went to visit, because my wife found the world's oldest farmer's market. It started in 1730. So, like, what, 40 years before America started, or maybe longer if my math is off. 17... Yeah, 46 years. Yeah, 46 years before the country started. And so we had all these expectations. I was thinking, like, it's just going to be a bunch of Amish people in, like, a shack. And it wasn't. It was a really nice setup. And it almost made the Amish people that were there working not look Amish, almost like they were wearing a costume. Kind of like, you know, when yeah. you go to, like, uh, Disneyland and you go to, like, the couple of the rides where everyone's dressed like cowboys? Yeah. That's how it kind of felt. Because I'm like, <laughs> you're Amish, but you're also taking tap. So I'm <laughs> like, like, how authentic is this jam? It is fascinating, yeah. Yeah, and they just, they're doing it out there, selling sausage and jam. And that was, like, the one brand of people that we did see, the Amish, that was in between the major cities of Philly and Pittsburgh, where I'm like, I... These people scare me less, which the Amish should have scared me the most. They don't know what's going on. They don't have cell phone addiction. They're not on social media. They should terrify me. But out of those people that I saw at those rest stops in between here and there, I was like, you know what? I'll take them any day. I was like, I'll, I'll absolutely take them. So wonderful shows out there. Also a big shout out to Judy in Pittsburgh for bringing cookies. Uh, she brought a Tupperware this big full of cookies and brownies. Okay. So I was backstage and the lady who ran the theater was like, some lady gave me this. And she goes, give this to Zoltan. <laughs> and then I looked and it was, a ve- there was a very heartfelt card. Uh, it was very sweet of you. You made my wife and I tear up before the show. She lost her husband before the show. And apparently both of them liked my comedy and he had like stage three something cancer. Damn. And couldn't make it to the show. She came with a friend and she baked me cookies and just wrote this really nice card. And so thank you, Judy. And we ashamedly have been eating all the cookies and brownies. <laughs> like you gave us enough cookies and brownies to feed the entire theater. And we're like, we should hand some of these out. And then we just never did. And the theater emptied. So we <laughs> took this Tupperware full of cookies back to the hotel. And since Friday, we've just been chowing down <laughs> cookies and brownies. We got like two cookies and a brownie left. And now we're arguing. Now it's gotten to the point where Emma and I, Emma's like, you already finished your cookies. You're starting to dip into my pile. So I say this as a very much thank you, Judy. That was incredibly sweet. Anyone else watching this going, oh, I'll bring him some baked goods. Please don't. Please don't. Because Emma and I don't have... One of the things I love about Emma and I's relationship is that we eat. There's a lot of couples out there that don't eat. I watch them at restaurants. They sit down at a restaurant and they'll talk. And, like, eat slowly, just pick at food. My wife and I, we talk at a restaurant until the food arrives. Then we act like we don't know each other. <laughs> and we dive into that food with fury. There's food. There's, it's on our forehead. It's flying all over the table. 
And we don't talk again until the waiter comes back and goes, would you like dessert? And then we give each other the eye, going, are we doing the dessert? And then she'll eventually be brave enough to go, can we see the dessert menu? And then we'll decide. And if that dessert comes, we shut up again. We just kind of divide it with our eyes, you know, like we'll order one dessert and split it. And we'll give each other the stink eye if we're if we've broken over the Mason Dixon line of evenness. <laughs> and uh, we kind of chow that, chow that down. And so don't bring dessert. <laughs> the moral of the story is please don't bring me desserts because my wife and I will eat it. And then we will fat shame ourselves. <laughs> we don't do it to each other. I never call my wife fat. My wife never calls me fat. We do it to ourselves. And then we tell each other not to do it to ourselves, if that makes sense. But thank you for bringing cookies. I, um, that's the opposite of what I want to be. I don't want to eat cookies. I just want to be built like Aaron Rodgers <laughs> on Hard Knocks. Do you watch Hard Knocks? <clears throat> not really. No, I, watch- I know I've seen it, but I don't like watch it regularly. I didn't, uh, I just watched the first episode, and Aaron Rodgers is on the Jets now, and he looks in, I didn't realize how great a shape he was in. Yeah, because he looks kind of like, uh, just like, his face kind of gives like caveman vibes, or like kind of, yeah, he but doesn't, he's ripped. His upper body and his face look like, looks like he lives in a cabin. Yeah, exactly. And, and he's like mailing things that he shouldn't be to people. And he's like 40 he, now, too. Yeah, he's older. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but I didn't realize how great a shape he was in because he wasn't in pads. You know, he's just no. like doing spring training or whatever. And he's just in a shirt. He has giant legs. <laughs> Dude, he is built, <laughs> he's built like a giraffe if, a giraffe's legs weren't long but wide. And he has, like, this skinny upper body. He has mm. the upper body of somebody who, like, healthy but not an athlete. And mm. then a lower body of someone that's like, oh, that's all you do. You did it in reverse. Like, most dudes Duh. only work upper body, never do legs. You're doing, like, this inverse, which might be why he gets to play as long as he does. But um, I want to be built like Aaron Rodgers. And all I wanted to do, I was like, I want to be a New York City morning person because we live right by Prospect Park. And I want to wake up in the morning, run the park. That was supposed to be my plan for today. Wake up in the morning, run the park, go get a haircut, then come over here and do this. I did none of those things. <laughs> I did none of those things. I set my alarm for 7. I reset it again for 8 and then 9. And then I got up around 10 and hopped in the shower and then just came here. And I, you know what threw us off was last night, uh, my wife and I, we got into uh, The Ultimatum on Netflix. Do you watch that show? Are you single? <laughs> no. Oh, you're funny. not single. All no. right. Are you married? No, girlfriend. Girlfriend. Yeah, How yeah, long yeah. you guys been together? Uh, about eight, nine months. Eight, nine yeah, months. Yeah, All yeah. right. So do you, do you guys, does she like trash TV? or is she not, not really. No? no. Okay. That's okay. the thing. We'll watch like, last night, we did watch something last night, but we watched like a, a Netflix documentary about some girl who got kidnapped. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We're big on those yeah. too. Yeah. If a girl goes missing, uh, we got into a heavy rotation of sex trafficking stories yeah. on YouTube. Okay, yeah. Uh, which I didn't appreciate. I'm like, you're really changing my algorithm by just... Because she's watching them on her own. Oh. And then I'm like, you're hiding my wrestling. Like, my pro wrestling is getting... It's such a weird... <laughs> my like, algorithm's my, got both those things as well. Yeah, dude. Like <laughs> My YouTube algorithm's wild. Yeah. It, we actually found it. We had a friend of hers house it for us, and we found out she was depressed based on what she was watching on our YouTube <laughs> algorithm. I was like, oh, I think, I think your friend's going through a rough patch. She's like, well, I'm like... Look at these videos that are coming up now. It's all like you can do it videos, mm-hmm. and uh, so anyway, it's it's weird what happens with the YouTube algorithm. But she got heavy into like sex trafficking stories, which are insane. And every story you hear, you always feel like you're missing a part of it because of that part of it where you're in plain sight but a prisoner to somebody mm-hmm. just seems so out of the ordinary for the rest of our lives. Where I'm like how we live life and you're like how i still don't get it but it's fascinating so she watches a bunch of those but then we also watch trash tv we watch uh the ultimatum which um i was it's where so a couple one of them wants to get married the other one's not sure and they take all these couples and they come into like a, a situation and then they mingle with each other and then they pick someone else to live with for three weeks in a trial marriage huh. And then after that trial marriage, they do another trial marriage with the person they actually showed up with. And then at the end, the person that was given the ultimatum of, are you going to marry me or not, has to decide, am I going to marry this person, leave the show alone, or leave with someone that I met 
in the ultimatum. That's wild. Yeah. So if I think the working title for that show is uh, "You either marry me or I'm gonna bang this guy." <laughs> I, 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 that's essentially. That's I would. Yeah. Oh, they t- and they're like to and they're like le- been together for a while before they enter the show. Yeah, yeah. So some I, I feel like this season a lot of the couples are two years in, two or three years in. One of them was seven years in. Damn. This one couple from South Carolina, they're high school sweethearts, and this guy just can't open his heart. Like, he's like, uh, I can't be emotionally available because I haven't told all my dark secrets yet. I mean, he was clearly, like, molested, but he just won't <laughs> say it. Just say it, you know? Right. You don't, not on TV, but tell her. Right. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, so, yeah, one seven years, but everyone else is, like, in the two to four year range. And it's, man, they're good. I hate, every time my wife puts one of those shows on, whether Love is Blind where they like talk through rooms where they can't see each other <laughs> or selling sunset where these supermodels pretend they're real estate agents. Uh, I get, I get sucked into all those shows and I don't want to be, but it's the way they're edited. The way their shot keeps flowing. You don't know when one episode ends and the other one starts. I love the music. Right. They have transitional music to get out of scenes that aren't real songs. Like, the lyrics are too on the nose to what just happened mm. in the scene, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. there'll be an argument, and then it'll pan to, like, a, a sunset, and the song will be like, the sun is setting <laughs> on us, and then it'll just cut to the... But it's, like, oddly it's specific. Like, a couple sure. will get into an argument, and the guy's wearing a red shirt, and then at the end, it'll be like, I told you I hate red. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do this? And it, it, it's so... I don't know if anyone notices this, but if you watch Trash TV, and all the shows do this, so they must be produced by the same company. All of them have these songs that I know for a fact you could never find the full version of that song because the lyrics are so specific to what is going on. My Uber's outside. (laughs) It's a five-star rate, and you're like, what? It's, it's. I love it. I'm a big fan of like the intricacies of it. And and the fact the product placement in there is so funny. Like you can clearly tell that this season of the Ultimatum is sponsored by those new wine glasses that are uh, stainless steel, like the the ones that you can't. They just look like a chalice from like the medieval times. Mm-hmm. They're in every scene. Every restaurant has them. The Airbnbs that they put them up has them. And you're like, they're just shoving these things down our throats. And um, I that and candles like the. The last scene where they all have to like give their confessionals and they all sit in a round table. The, there are so many candles on there that I'm sure there's like an OSHA employee off to the set and they're just like looking at all these hair extensions and hairspray and makeup and you're like, how many flammable people are you gonna put next <laughs> to these candles? <laughs> like we're all gonna get fired. There are more candles than like a Catholic mass uh, during like Christmas, like a midnight mass. There's just candles upon candles. It's like a memorial for like an artist that died, and they're over there going, "Well, Stephen isn't being open," and there's just like eight thousand candles behind them. And I don't, I get sucked into these trash TV shows. I love them all, and I wish I didn't. Like I wish I didn't. I wish I hated the Kardashians, but I don't. I I get sucked into it. There's something about their personalities. They make you feel better. Right. About whatever relationship you're in. Yeah, they're popular for a reason. I mean, yeah, they were. They are entertaining. They're just, it's just like mind numbing almost. Yeah, they make you feel dumb, Matthew. Right. End. And that's how it felt. Like last night I had a fantasy football draft. <laughs> and then after that, I'm like, let's watch one episode of this and I'll go to bed. And then I looked up and it's 1 a.m. And I was like, oh, so much for waking up at seven <laughs> to go run the park. <laughs> and it didn't happen. Every time I tried to wake up, it's just, it doesn't happen. The night, the morning before, I tried to wake up, but in the at six a.m., our cat Miso puked in the bed that we like in the Ooh. middle of the bed. I woke up to. Yes, you have to wake up then. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I woke up to, you know, like that slurping, yeah. and I thought it was my wife obnoxiously drinking a glass of water. <laughs> that's what that I thought. Yeah, that's funny. what I thought it was, and I was about to be like, "Are you serious right now?" And then I opened my eyes, and I just see Misa going, and I said, "Damn it, no!" And I shoved her off the bed hopefully like hoping that i shoved her before she but she had already yacked <laughs> all over the bed and then she yacked some more on the rug damn and uh that's when i realized because that's something i've been talking about on this podcast for a while uh, is like we're thinking about having kids and that was such a 
a decisive moment where like i don't think i'm ready for childhood <laughs> or, I, parenthood i'm yeah. not ready to have a child in the house because you can't just wake up and go damn it no at like a baby and you can and shove it off shove the it off the bed <laughs> you're getting it on the comforter <laughs> and uh yeah it was a real telltale uh sign that yeah, maybe you're not ready you know <laughs> And it's good. It's because that cat overeats. Miso overeats. She gets. We have two cats, Mushi and Miso, and Miso is so territorial that she'll overeat herself, and then she yaks everywhere. So when we moved here, I used to feed them a lot less food, so she couldn't overeat, and she wasn't throwing up. But she was waking up at six a.m. because she wanted food, and she would try to wake us up. And my wife is like forget this, we're getting automatic cat feeders. So we got these automatic cat feeders that go off at 6 a.m. with her voice. You can record your own voice. So at oh, 6 wow. a.m., my wife's voice goes, meal time, <laughs> and cable <laughs> shoots out. And Miso eats both the bowls. She goes and oh, like damn. somehow blocks it out and eats both the bowls, overeats, throws up in the bed, or somewhere else. And uh, and then the other cat's just starving the rest of the day. The other cat's just like, come on, man. Like, What the hell is going on? Miso has whatever my wife and I have with sweets. This is why I don't bring me sweets after the show. Same. Uh, but, yeah, you're the same? Terrible sweet tooth. I can't. It's not even, it's more than a sweet tooth. It's also like, this is my mentality. When we have a bucket of sweets, I'm like, well, let's eat it all <laughs> now. Like, this is bad that we have it, but let's not space this out for a week. Let's just crush it all tonight get it out of our system, right. and then we go buy a bucket of salad at the grocery <laughs> store, and we undo the next seven days of what we just did today. Right. And my wife is a normal human where she's like, no, let's have a cookie a day and space it out. But that's just like torture for me. It's not yeah. how I grew up. Like my, I was raised by my mom where she's like, all right, we shouldn't have this pumpkin pie in this house, so let's get rid of it. Oh, blah, blah. <laughs> and we eat the whole pie, and then we move wow. on with our lives. And we kind of like binge eat it, and then we don't buy another pie. And that's not how my wife was raised, I guess, regular, where you just kind of have <laughs> yeah, a well. cookie every night. <laughs> you know? That's, that's so impo hard to do, though. One cookie. How do you do it? I have no idea. How do you do it? I'm the same, dude. Ice cream and, and like candy. Yeah. Like the ice cream, like my, you know, when I was a kid, like, you know, my dad buy like a gallon of ice cream. Yeah. And it's not even that, it, it's big, but it's not that big. And it's like, I could do two bowls and this will be gone. Yes. In one night. And that's pretty much what I would do. <laughs> or or when you get the bucket of it and it's the chocolate swirl. So you scoop down the middle. Oh, yeah. Where all the swirl the like part, really yeah. bundles the eye of the hurricane of oh, this yeah. ice cream. And you just scoop that out. You. <laughs> I remember once I did that and my mom was so mad. She's like, that was the best part. <laughs> like, you just, you're just <laughs> you supposed to like space me. that out. And I was like, I don't know. That's funny. It was, it was a good section of it. But yeah, I don't know <laughs> how to moderate. Like, so when I lived alone, I had no junk food in the house. Damn. They used to drive Emma nuts when she used to come over. She's like, you don't have any snacks? I got you know, nothing, dude. And I'm like, I have nothing because I'll eat it all. Yeah. So I remember one time she bought a thing of Oreos, and and she put it in there. She had, like, two Oreos, put them away. It drove me nuts. I'm like, how do you have two? And you just put it away. And then, like, three days later, she came back to my place. She's like, what's up with them Oreos? I was like, what? Those are gone. <laughs> like, those were gone the That's, next day. Yeah. After you left, I went on an Oreo party. I was naked, covered in cream, and it was over. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. That's, I would have done the same thing. Yeah. Like, it's a real thing. I got to keep healthy food around me, and I got to exercise every day because I don't have the say no to say no to drugs in me. Yeah. If it's around, it's around. But, um, but, yeah, so that's what, I don't know. My wife and I, we we blend on a lot. Like, she's better at moderation, but she likes junk food as much as I do. And then we're also the same level of uh, introverts. Like, uh, I don't, if you see the shirt, this is the New York City Backgammon, backgammon Club. Uh, they have a backgammon club in New York. It's like a meetup. Oh, yeah, I think you said, talked about this on one of the episodes. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, my wife and I, oh, that's right. And I did talk about that, how we've, we've gone twice now. And both times... We have not mingled with the other people. <laughs> we sit in the corner, and the nice girl who runs it, she's like, do you guys want to? And we're just, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, we got another game. We don't meet up with anybody. Like, the last That's one was funny. at a Persian restaurant. My wife is Persian. And so we just kept ordering food. It's so funny because everyone's playing back game and have, like, a cocktail. Right. We're have, we got drinks. We got appetizers. We got a main course. Mm -hmm. 
we got it looks like we're there for dinner and we're eventually gonna play backgammon that's right. what it looks like and uh yeah we're just naturally antisocial. <laughs> where we we want to be social but it's also what it is is we'll be there playing backgammon or eating at this last place <laughs> and the table next to us will have two people that don't know each other and they're playing backgammon and we hear that awkward conversation of like oh where are you from oh yeah is this the rule and then you you just hear that conversation it's like do you want to do that or do you want to <laughs> just do this right. where it's not uncomfortable like that and we can play backgammon and eat like slobs instead of trying to be like on a first date almost right. with with some stranger who wants to play backgammon at a bar and it's just like i don't know trying to break out of that and be a friend to somebody <laughs> it's so hard when your significant other's right there and you're just like this feels way more comfortable <laughs> this feels so much more comfortable we avoid eye contact with people at that place <laughs> like, like someone new will come in with their backgammon board and just try to like you know make eyes like trying to connect with somebody Play, yeah. which is the point of the meetup right. and my wife and i will divert eye contact with everybody <laughs> and we're like this you is just play at the house <laughs> I we should. <laughs> We're essentially just playing at the house, and then but we feel because we got on a train and went somewhere. It was that like we went out. Yeah. But we didn't go out. Like we we went out, but we didn't talk to anybody. It was uh, I don't know. I guess that's us. I think we just got to embrace who we are. Like, are you and your girlfriend? Are you guys pretty social people? Her way more than me. Oh, okay. you guys at least share it. I mean, I'm like I'm like you guys. She's very life of the party, social. Like, so she kind of pulls me in. I get, I'm a little bit better now because I'm with her, but I'm still more introverted. And do you she, ever get called out for not like? Do you ever have a bad time at a party where you're just like, I'm just not connecting with anybody, and I'm trying. And then does she ever call <laughs> you out afterwards? She's like, Yeah, you really. That was a bad performance at that <laughs> at that housewarming. Yeah, yeah, when we first started dating, but she I've just I've now I've met all her friends, I know everybody and they're like all pretty cool, so I can I can I can hold my own where at least I'm it's not great for me on the inside, but you can't really tell. Right. So, but yeah, a little bit in the beginning, but not so much anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. That's good. So she's actually it was kind of like with the conversation I had with uh Steven where his girlfriend or fiance is super uh extroverted. Yeah. And he just tries to keep up, you know. Yeah, that's us. Yeah, it's I. I don't know. I think, I think both are good for their own reasons. Like my wife and I, at least we're on the same page where we go to a thing, and it's like, well, one of us has to step up, right? And it's usually she does a great job of it. She thinks she doesn't do a great job. She does an excellent job, but she looks at me, and it's kind. Of, I guess because I do comedy or something. She's like, well, this is you're up, kid. Yep. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> I do I do comedy, and then. Good Lord, then the, then it's the last thing you ever want to tell anybody is that you do comedy. It's kind of like I used to work for this guy who's my best friend's dad. He was a mechanic. And the last thing he ever wanted to tell anyone at a party was that he was a mechanic because then people would tell him all the issues they have with their car. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you'd tell people he was a used car salesman and then nobody ever talked to him. <laughs> he's, he's like, dude, if you sell used cars, nobody talks to you. Well, the worst is when, or the worst is when you're with someone who you're closer to, and then you're meeting somebody, and then they tell them you're a comedian, and you didn't even, you didn't even like, they don't even know you, and then, yeah. and then now they're just like, oh, you know, and they're asking you all the questions. That's the worst. Yeah, it's all of the. I mean, that's a classic. They've done Seinfeld episodes about right. that. Like, oh, he's going to use this in his act yeah, and all yeah. that stuff. It's like, I promise you, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise you, none of you are that interesting. One hundred percent. That that any of this is going in, if any of this is going in, it's going to be how uncomfortable I was <laughs> in this setting and how much I nodded in a conversation where I didn't know what the hell you were talking about. Oh yeah, I so many of those. Con I realized going like meeting other people how little I know about almost everything. Me too. Yeah, me, literally exactly me. Like I could probably I could get I could dive in on maybe two or three subjects where you'll all actually like sound like i know what i'm talking about yeah in other instances i'm just nodding and like yeah <laughs> you had uh, uh, this guy was a commercial developer at one of these parties we went to and he bought old spaces or with a group or something and he would try to convert them not to living spaces but to kind of like communal workspace type things right. but it was different and i tried to really understand what the hell he was saying but he also he was also, I think he didn't understand what he was saying. 
<laughs> and I, I, I kind of, I kind of feel like if I don't understand what you do for a living, because I'm, I'm average intelligence, where right. I'm not stupid, but I'm also not smart. But if I don't get what you do, I think what you do is kind of a scam. It probably is too. Yeah, it, yeah. It's kind of <laughs> like when people explain explain like crypto to me, or they're like, "Oh, we do this," and you're like, "No, it's not multi level marketing. It's this." And I'm like, "I think it's a scam because I don't get it." Yeah, yeah. It should be simple enough to understand. Yeah, crypto is a good example. You could explain. I've been explained crypto five hundred times, and I still don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> and then I know a lot of people made money at it, and that's always people's arguments. Like, well, a lot of people made money at it. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of scams that people have made a lot of money at, mm. but most people lost. Yeah, I think is the is the big circle right. that you would put on that. Like right. most people, yeah. yeah, most people were not pumped about it. I knew it was a bad idea when the guy who in my friend circle knew the most about crypto is my best friend Dane, and he's a truck driver. <laughs> he's a, he drives trucks in San Diego for uh, for a company and like big rigs and stuff. And he's like, ah, dude, it's blockchain. Ah, dude, they mine it. And he would, and I'm like, the fact that you understand it more than me makes me not trust any of this at all. <laughs> and not because he's dumb. It's just that he's the same sure. level of intelligence as me. And I'm like, I need someone above my pay grade right. to go. No, no, no. This is the right thing you should do. <laughs> I don't know. Um, what else? You got the. Did you see the Trump mugshot? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty what funny. I, wasn't it kind of what you expected? Yeah. Yeah. I was I was just like, all right, yeah, and, you know. What, what are you expecting? Like, he's going to smile or something? Right. I, it was it was so weird because it was so much buildup for the, I remember when I my Emma showed me the photo and I was like, that's exactly what I thought it would look like. Yeah. It was almost like when like an Aaron Rodgers, like an athlete plays for one team for 20 years right. and then he moves to another team and you're like, man, I wonder what he's going to look like in a Jets uniform. And then you see it and you're like, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, that we look like <laughs> that, that, that is a lot of build up for not much. Yeah. And, and then I saw Trump's mugshot and it was perfect. Right. It was perfect. It's perfect for every like that is going to be the biggest piece of merch in the history of merchandise is People that love them will buy it. People that hate them will buy it. And it's the best thing that could have ha ever happened to him. I don't know to become president, but like to for him as a brand, mm -hmm. that's like Johnny Cash's mugshot times 100. Like when artists would get arrested and they would take their mugshot right. and like it would be merch. It's that to a million. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. The scowl. The fact that I wonder if he practiced it. I wonder if he had like a. Uh, like, yeah, he just looks. Like, that's what his face always looks like, though. He's never really making. He's always got like a kind of like a mug on. He does. Like he like does, but it frown. was almost. Yeah, it's true. It looked like he didn't rehearse at all. That's probably why he's perfect. <laughs> he is the most uh, photogenic person I think on the planet. Not for the looks of classic beauty, but for portraying who you are naturally in almost every photograph that you're in. Right. Like, have you, you've had headshots done right. for comedy, right? Yeah. I've had a bunch of headshots done. There's so many pictures that come back where I'm like, who is that? Right. I'm making a face I would never make. Same, yeah. I, that is not me at all. That does not portray any part of my personality. Right. Every photo you find of Trump, you're like, that's him. Mm -hmm. That's him in that moment. And he is so, like, secure and understanding of who he is and what he is that he just, he's the most photogenic dude ever. Like, there's photos of me sometimes I'll come up that aren't even professional photos, just like random pics I'm tagged in, even on stage, where I'm like, that's me? Right. That's what the, I look like with that kind of shading? How many mugshots are there of celebrities who are like, good Lord, that's Mel Gibson? Yeah. He looks like he lived under a ditch for a week. Like, he looks horrible. And then <laughs> Trump just with the scowl and the thing. And I'm not, I'm not endorsing him or knocking him because I know everybody that will whatever but like he's perfect for what he is he's uh, if there's anyone who's ever like fully actualized their brand and who they are he's nailed it oh yeah he is like what the uh, jake paul type is striving to become right uh and he's almost I, th I i was thinking about this in the shower he's at nate diaz level of fandom where it doesn't... Do you know Nate Diaz? Yeah. Are you an MMA fan? Yeah. Nate, for the people that don't know, because I have a lot of cat ladies that like me, so they're <laughs> probably not big on the mixed martial arts. Nate Diaz is uh, an, uh, he's a great fighter, but he's a little long in the tooth. He's lost a lot of fights. He bleeds a lot. Mm -hmm. He comes back from behind. He takes a beating, and, but at the end, he's built such a fandom that it doesn't 
matter if he loses. No one even talks about the winner. They just talk about, remember when Nate Diaz was bleeding from his eyes? Right. And then while he's getting his ass kicked, he like kind of landed a punch and they flipped the guy off or laughed at him. Right. And then he's just this iconic level. Of, that's where Trump's at. Anything can happen to Trump. Mm -hmm. He can get arrested. He could win the Nobel Peace Prize. He could be on anything. And like the people that love him will love him even more. It's uh, it's an iconic place to be at. Kind of says a lot about where we are. But <laughs> I think I think uh, I don't know. I don't know because I know if I ever have a mugshot, it's gonna it's gonna look. It's going to express all of my insecurities all in one photo. <laughs> like, I'll be pasty. I'll be sweaty. Maybe, like, my lazy eye will come out. Like, every once in a while, I'll take a photo where I'm like, do I have a lazy eye? Do <laughs> I? Yeah, that one points that way sometimes. I think I do. I think that might actually come up. I know that will be my mugshot. His was just, he's perfect. He knows who he is. Yeah, he always looks the same. Exactly the same. He, uh, he's got it down. What else did I have? Amish country made fun of that. Oh, I gave to a GoFundMe. That is true. You ever give to GoFundMe's? Maybe once or twice. You get suckered into them, or like every once in a while something catches you? Mm, yeah, I think the only time I've ever actually donated it is it's like uh, either a friend or a friend of a friend. Someone like I know close enough where I'm like, all right, I think it's going where it's supposed to be going. But right. I'd never given to like a random one just because I like was sympathize with the cause or whatever. I, yeah, I guess I've always had a connection. Yeah. I, I agree. But then as comedians, During COVID, because I think it, one was like to save a business. It's like a friend of a friend's business. Okay. So I was yeah. just like, all right, something like that. I, um, I'm with you. I don't think I've ever given to a GoFundMe where I... Not like like in some form or fashion, I know the person. Yeah. Uh, but GoFundMe is a weird place where they'll just like throw different things all on the same platform and it will kind of mess with your morality. Right. Like, uh, it was a couple weeks ago, there was a GoFundMe for a comedy club, Third Wheel Comedy Club out in LA. It's run by comedians. Oh, yeah, I've done that It's room. just a space, right? Yeah. But it's run by, like, a collective of, like, four or five comedians. I've done it. It's great. It's yeah. a fun little run. I've done it. Yeah, it's good. And they had a GoFundMe because they needed an air conditioner because uh, their air conditioner went to went to crap and they don't have any money. Right. And uh, they're like, we can't do shows and it's sweltering in there. So I... I I saw it and I was like, man, these guys, you know, just running this. So I donated like a hundred bucks and I felt really good about that. And I was like, you know, felt like uh, I was giving back to the community. And then, but the next day I had a fan of mine reach out to me. He had to go fund me cause he has cancer. And he's like, listen, my medical bills are covered. I just need, I can't work. So I just need some extra money to like cover my rent and stuff. Can you share this? And so I'm like, absolutely. So I shared it to my story, but I'm like, I can't, share it without giving to it too. Mm -hmm. So uh, then I went to click on it and then I had j and then I'm doing morality math in my head cuz I'm like I can't I can't give the same exact amount I did for the air conditioner. And I'm like that's never a thought I've had in my head where I'm like I gave to this guy's air conditioner yesterday $100. So I think I owe this guy like $1000. But I don't have $1000 to give to this right. guy. And it's like this weird I think there needs to be different websites for this, like air conditioners and uh, grandma's never been to Disneyland. GoFundMe's <laughs> need to be over here and, uh, and like serious life medical or death, health. Medical yeah. issues need to be over there. Yeah. Like, I really wish I would have gotten those GoFundMe's in the opposite order. Right. Because I would have given 100 bucks to the cancer and then like 50 bucks to the AC. <laughs> but instead, I got the AC first and I gave 100 bucks to that. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> I can't just be willy nilly throwing money around. Right. And then later that week, someone else threw up that they have multiple sclerosis. And I'm like, everyone's falling apart. Jesus. And I'm like, I can't, wait, can't just, you know. Like get your air. Now I was mad at the air conditioning people. I'm like, dude, there's people. That's nothing, yeah. Yeah, dude, there's people melt, dude. There's <laughs> like, let your audience melt. I already gave you Open money. Open the window. I wish you would have came in third. <laughs> I, I think that's the. I think that kind of sums up where uh, phone addiction and social media anxiety kind of come from. Mm -hmm. It in in one form of example, it's just every problem that everyone has thrown on you. Sure. And then that's the GoFundMe stress, and you want to help, but you're also like, I'm not rich by any means. I can't just be throwing hundreds of dollars around. Right. And then, and then you add in like social media stress of like, you know, stress of social media. I'm ugly. I'm not successful. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's about that's if you had to narrow down 
what social media causes you. It's a uh, stress of I'm ugly and I'm not successful and <laughs> nobody likes me. 100%. I'm ugly, not successful, nobody likes me. <laughs> I'm ugly, not successful, nobody likes me. And then every time you just keep doing that, you swipe and it refreshes. I'm ugly, <laughs> I'm not successful, nobody likes me. Look at all those people in that photo. I'm not in that photo. <laughs> Oh man, I'm ugly again. <laughs> Not success. How'd you get into that? They got into that, and then it's just. Oh, I've been trying not to be on social media, and uh, so I, hard. I deleted it on all, all my. I deleted it on my phone. Oh, do you um, do you have like a backup phone? No. So what I do is, like, I you only go on when you're home. You can go. On, you'll go on your laptop. So that's the plan on all of them except for Instagram. Instagram. Because I don't know how to do a story on my laptop on Instagram. Yeah, I think I've been on Instagram, on, uh, not on my phone, maybe like once ever. <laughs> yeah. I'm always yeah, on my phone. I don't phone. even know how that works. Yeah. So what I do is I have all social media deleted on my phone. Okay. And I download it. I download Instagram once a day to check all my messages, respond, and do my stories. Right. And then I get off and I delete it again. I've only been doing this for a week now, so I'm very new. Okay. But my anxiety has gone down. So like, that's, So like you'll wake up and post what you want and then get off? Yeah, I, I, not, I try not to do it in the morning, too, because I'm very sensitive in the morning. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I just realized that much. <laughs> Dude, you know what I just thought of? I, as I said that sentence, I was just picturing, like, a group of cavemen beating a mammoth with a stick <laughs> to, like, eat for a week, and then they're freezing in the tundra. And I'm like, yeah, I'm too sensitive in the morning to look at Instagram. And I'm like, ah, oh, we're all going to die soon. I, but yeah, I'm too sensitive in the morning to like, I don't want to read comments and I right. don't want to look at stuff. So I wait till like, I haven't gone on Instagram today, today. So when I go home from this in the afternoon, I'll go on Instagram, do my posts, respond to messages, shoot messages I need to respond to. And then I'll delete it and right. not go on till the next day. That's incredible. That's probably so great too. When you have like an actual legit following and there's comments looking and stuff yeah like, well, i'll literally go on instagram and then i'll be like all right and i'll like just click to see my notification because i don't have a huge following so i don't have a lot of stuff to like i'm not right. reacting to whatever and then i'll get off and then i'll just be like i don't know i'll be doing something or whatever and then i'll just like without even realizing it find myself back on instagram like a minute or two later all the time and i'm like this is insane my screen time is ridiculous yeah it's it's uh it's insane how addicted i am to it because to me it's a lot like junk food Right. Like, let me just eat all the junk food, get it out, right. and then I can be fresh, but this junk food never goes away. Yeah, exactly. It keeps refreshing of, I'm ugly, I'm not successful, and nobody, nobody likes me. Likes me. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I turned it on. It's only been a week. Like, who knows? Maybe I'll crack and I'll fall back into it. But right. just from that this week, it feels really nice because you know what it's like when you, especially because we post our comedy on there mm -hmm. and you read the comments. It's weird because you do the set in person. Right. And obviously people laughed because you wouldn't post the video otherwise. Mm -hmm. You're happy with the clip that you're posting. Ex I, yeah, yeah, exactly. And instead of just doing the set, getting the response from the audience, enjoying that and living your life, now you got to post it, and now you're checking how many people like this. Right. It's almost like you're still on stage getting, trying to get all the responses you can get to that joke. Yeah. And it's like, well, when is it over? When is it over? Right. And I... I um, I think Mark Norman said this on a podcast or something. I'm sure he did. Uh, but he's, <laughs> he's, he's on all so of them. On all he's them. on all of them. But he said he still checks all his notification. Yeah, and scrolls which... through. And he has like a million... Oh, he's got a million followers. Yeah, yeah on Instagram and, and probably more on other things. That and, fascinates me. And Well, th what that led to me is like, when is it over? I guess it's never over. Exactly. Because I'm like, when I get to a certain... Like, even if I just got to like whatever... X hundred thousands of followers, I'd be like, I'm never going to look at anything. No. And then if those guys are looking at it, I'll be like, because like, I, I just, you know, I guess it always hits you when it's personal and stuff, but. Yeah. Dude, uh, comments get me good. And so, I, and I'll delete comments. Yeah. I've talked about that before. Oh, like, really? Oh, I'll delete I comments. I actually have a clip. I literally have a clip on my YouTube and it's my by far my most viewed clip of stand-up. And it's negative. Like, all the comments are like, this is horrible, it's not funny, whatever. But the views are, like, insane. So I like I don't want to take it down because it's like, you know, they're laughing in the clip. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put it up. So I'm like, but it's literally, like, all hate in the comments. I get a new <laughs> notification on my YouTube every day. This, <sighs> this joke sucks. I hope he doesn't do this anymore. Oh, my it's God. It's hilarious. Someone told me, it might have been on this show, but someone told me it's all, like, open micers. Doing the comments? Yeah. It's all Probably. Like, a lot of the critique comments. 
Yeah, I'm sure. Where, like, you know, the in-depth, you know, because there's like a comment that's like, you suck. Right. But then there's a comment that's like, nah, dude, like, I'll break down why this sucks. Oh, that's what this clip is. Yeah. It's yeah. like, this sucks because whatever. Or it's like, you know, this is unfunny, not funny. And yeah, that's like, the right. same as like being in middle school and being called fat. Right. Or as opposed to another bully going, not only are you fat, this is why you're fat. <laughs> Specifically here, here, and really here. I love like, that too. And, and you're like, wow. Okay. And then, yeah, and it's the fact that if they're just like random people and they're not comedians, I'd be like, that's so interesting that you, I guess, think you know more than me. I mean, maybe you do, but like about how but to critique don't. a joke or something. Yeah, I don't think it's Especially it, yeah. if they're open mic comedians, it just means you're brand new at something. Yeah, exactly. I used to see that in the mechanic world when I worked at a mechanic shop. Oh, yeah? I didn't work on cars. I worked in the office, but my best friend's dad, who I worked for, was a mechanic. Okay. And like guys would come in and do one, like they'd fix one thing on their truck. So they thought they knew about mechanic stuff. Right. And then they'd come in, tell my boss what was wrong with their truck and they're like oh i watched a youtube video on how to fix it i just don't have the tools can you do this mm -hmm. and one time daryl was so fed up with this happening he goes i'll give you the tools you do it and i won't charge you and it was a job that would have taken him like the mechanic maybe like six hours to do mm -hmm. and he's like well the video says it's like 15 minutes he goes all right do it <laughs> he was there for a week dude <laughs> He was there for five days until he finally tapped out and said, Daryl, I can't do it. And then he's like, okay. And then he's like, well, I thought your video would tell you how to do it. And then <laughs> <laughs> he was like a real dick about it. Sure. And then he went and fixed it. But it's kind of the same thing. You know, you're uh, a, not that a newer comic can't have an opinion about things, but sometimes you take these like really big Philo like a uh, philosophy around what you think stand up is, sure. and then you start breaking down people's jokes and stuff, and then you're like, "Do you do this to your own work?" Yeah, because I I would love to see some of your stand up. Yeah, for real. And it'd be like, "Oh, okay, oh, all right." You're you're a you're a guy who became a film critic because you wanted to make films, and right. you went to NYU and somehow dropped out, and you never made a film, so now right. you're kind of picking on them. Yeah, you know? but yeah, I tried to get off all of that. I uh, I'm going to see if I can keep it up so far. It's That's been really good, working yeah. and just trying to keep the anxiety down. Yeah. Cause it's all, it just puts a little panic in my heart. Right. Every time. Sure. Like, why? Why? Sure. Why? When's it over? Yeah. <laughs> hey, people get, and then there's the people who just get up right away to go on and they're, they're the ones commenting. They're not even like receiving anything. You look, you know, all these comments on this clip, I'll go look, you know, it's, they have like one subscriber or it's like a, yeah. you know, it, it, <laughs> It's a fake account. It's a burn a burner account. There's no, they, you know, they have no picture. None. And I'm like, you got. Oh, are you guys on? They're just here. They're just. They're literally there solely to comment on the stuff rather than making their own stuff. Which I guess you need to have fans and stuff. But it's like, who who are you guys at the end of the day? Yeah. Like I've never. I don't think I've. I've felt the urge to leave a negative comment. Never done it. In the, I've never done it. And in the process of typing it, I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. Exactly. And then I get off. I'm like, I don't. Why do I need to give this guy? Right. You know, just, you watched it. Yeah. I watched it. I, you know, so you clearly kept my attention, whether or not I hated what you said or I liked it. Right. Somehow kept my attention long enough. I'm not going to leave a comment. But I, it's nothing against people that leave, po I do leave positive comments. Mm -hmm. Like a uh, big Metallica fan, every time they put like a video up, I'm like, oh, badass. Oh, that's I don't even, funny. I never even have a good comment, by right. the way. It's just like, <laughs> that's the, great. The horns. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, dude. It's not even anything very insightful. <laughs> but uh, I like that's to funny. leave like a positive comment here and there. But never. Oh, Hetfield he sounds bad today. He's, he's smoking too many cigars. I don't leave that kind of stuff. Right. Go on with your life. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think we're wrapping up. Well, we really fizzled down there yeah. at the end. Uh, you guys have been wonderful. We're going to, I'll have a guest next week. I think we have one set up. If not, I will do this again where I ramble about nonsense with uh, whoever's producing that day. And thank you so much for talking to me. By of course. The way. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And uh, cheers, everybody. Until next week. Trekking heavier, traveling light. There's one thing that's right wherever I go. That's where I am.